Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Hindi Project podcast. I believe this is episode eight. Alhamdulillah, we had Sister Asma Hussain with us. Uh, she is an author um, of a book, The Temporary Gift. She also authors some children books um, and has a very uplifting social media presence uh, with very positive, optimistic um, posts. So you should check it out if you haven't already. We had a really interesting conversation. We talked about um, you know, her experiences, um, we talked about her story a little bit, we talked about Egypt. Yeah, we talked about Egypt, and <laughs> we talked about, um, you know, social media and, you know, the YouTube shooter and, and how social media kind of warps people's views. So it was an interesting conversation. I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, so alhamdulillah, today I'm joined with Sister Asma Hussain. Uh, who is a writer and um, well known to many of you, I'm sure. And uh, finally, we're having a sister guest who's not related to me directly. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, step in the right direction, inshallah. Uh, again, Jazakallah khair for for coming in and uh, doing the show with us. Oh yeah, cool, my pleasure. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump right into the awkward because uh, I'm that kind of person that uh, like if I'm walking and there's a puddle. <clears throat> and I'm like, don't step in the puddle, don't step in the puddle. I'm gonna step in that puddle. I don't know why. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna step into it, uh, <laughs> whether I want to or not. So, so like we've known e- our families have known each other for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, we see each other often, just uh, walking by each other, but never actually had a conversation. This first conversation we're having. So, yeah, it's a good good place to start the conversation. But actually, like my last podcast was, was with uh, Sheikh Mustah Khan. Okay. And you know, uh, both both of us are working in Dawa. Both of us are in Toronto. Both of us have basically the same friends. We've never talked to each other before, so our oh, last wow. podcast was our first. I actually, conversation. I'm surprised by that. Yeah, it's just I don't know. He's East End and I'm West End, and we yeah. just never crossed paths before. So it's interesting. So the whole world gets to see the first uh, conversation <laughs> between us. Wow. Um, so you know, one of the things I wanted to do by bringing you on the podcast was really to talk about the work that you're doing. Um, how did you get into children's books? Like I'm seeing like, your children's books out there. and So the children's books started kind of in a funny way. <clears throat> At the end of 2013, I took a course with um, Hamda Sharif called mm-hmm. Visionaire. And it's all about, um, it's like a visioning course, but right. through the lens of uh, making dot, like how to, mm-hmm. how to achieve or how to figure out what goals you want to achieve and then sort of transform it into worship in a sense that you, um, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. You, um, you kind of rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you reach those goals. Right. So I actually had no idea that I wanted to do kids' books, but mm-hmm. then he had us do an exercise where we kind of just like free wrote a lot of the things that were on our mind, what mm-hmm. we could possibly want to do. And then he asked us to um, pick out the themes that repeated themselves. Right. And for some reason, kids' books was one of those themes, even though I had never thought of it before. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I had, but I hadn't really considered it seriously. So um, that came up and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I had no ideas. I had no ideas on what to write or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just include this in my dot because it seems like it's something that's important to me. Yeah. So I started including it in my dot for the next couple of months, uh, like amongst other things. Mm-hmm. And then one day I just thought of an idea, like a full story idea. It just came to me, which wow. is shocking because like as a writer, that almost never happens. Right. Like writing takes a lot of work and like you have to go back and forth and edit like a hundred times before something's even uh fit to be seen by the public essentially but um the story idea kind of just came to me and i was just like oh okay so Mm. this is a full story so i sat down and i wrote it i wrote it in one sitting the full story obviously i had like edits and drafts and stuff right but um that was bismillah soup that was my first book um so yeah and then i found it to be really fun yeah. So I'm like, why don't I keep doing this? And then I kept doing it. It's, okay. like, it's kind <laughs> of like an anticlimactic <laughs> story, but... Uh, <clears throat> that's interesting. Like, it's kind of mm. like you had that drive to write books, but you didn't even know you had that drive to write books. Yeah, like yeah. Books. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I've written before, but um, not for kids. Not for kids, yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't something that was kind of on my radar. Mm. But then um, I feel like sometimes when you're meant to do something, it's going to come into your life one way or, or the other. Right. right? So yeah, that was, wow. that's kind of a fun story. So I kind of did that 
visionary thing with Sheikh Mohammed, but mm -hmm. not part of the program. Uh, this was in the way back beginning days when I was part of Al Maghrib. Okay. So he kind of took us aside, and I guess he went through similar, um, maybe not like he was still developing it at that time. Yeah. Um, but it was the same thing, like write down everything that you want. And I guess the only theme that I had, like I had, di I had tremendous difficulty writing down things that I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was hard. It was yeah. hard. Um, but the one theme was like I wanted to kind of like social justice kind of thing that was and this is back like 10 years ago before anyone cared about social justice before mm -hmm. it was like popular to be right. into social justice but um, and I thought like in my head I'm like it's such an unreasonable thing for me to expect like Muslims at that time weren't even like like raise, like talking about anything or just run away from mm -hmm. a public sphere yeah. Um, but you're right. Like if you're meant to do something, it'll find a, it, it'll find its way to you almost sometimes. Yeah, like, yeah. You know. And sometimes, like I feel like, <clears throat> if your life isn't going in the direction, in that direction, mm -hmm. something will happen to kind of move you in that direction. Mm -hmm. Like even if you don't want it. Yeah. Um, and then only later you'll realize, oh, actually this was kind of a good thing, even though. Yeah. Like I didn't expect it. Or it was hard or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but I have to say that the Visionaire course that I took in uh, 2013 was a lot more developed. Mm -hmm. Like we actually sat there for two days. Wow. Um, it was like a retreat style. Yeah. Um, it was really good. Huh. And I'm not being paid to say this. It's not like a paid <laughs> advertisement. Like it was really, I think yeah. I, I took it also at a time in my life where um, like it was a few months after my husband passed away. Mm -hmm. And I was um, struggling a lot with trying to figure out where I wanted my life to go. Mm -hmm. Because like, now I'm sure you know, like when you're married, yeah. you make all your plans together with your spouse, right? right. And then if that spouse is no longer there, you kind of think, well, all the plans that I made for my future are now irrelevant or they're right. not, they're not going to happen. So you kind of just like, you face this like, it's like blankness almost. Mm. So I took it at that time. So that's why I think that's why it helped me in like specifically because it kind of gave me permission to go into my own, to go back to what my own goals were, you mm. know, not necessarily tied uh, into my relationship. So, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, I think that, yeah, you're right though. Like mm. just thinking about like, if my wife passed away, there would be like, yeah, you're right. Like every single goal you've kind of tied into the other person. Yeah. And a lot of them you just kind of like, well, I expect her to take care of this stuff. Like, I'm not even going to yeah. think about it. Cause yeah, I yeah, just yeah. Expect them so one of those things for me, sorry to interrupt, right. was um, like car maintenance. Oh, like, right. I would <laughs> never imagine myself going to get an oil change, going yeah. to the mechanic. Like, I mean, yeah, I could pump gas, fine. But like, beyond that. I didn't have to pump gas. My husband was going to pump gas for me. Like he was going to bring me the car full, like with a tank full of gas. Yeah. So I felt like I had to learn a lot after, um, like after he passed away, mm -hmm. just to, just to live, just to maintain. I, and like, it wasn't a bad experience learning all of those things, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, it's definitely, it was definitely a learning curve. But Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Do you find that that's like, like, do you feel guilty? Because um, like every painful situation we have in our lives, after a certain amount of time, you're kind of like, well, I, because of that painful situation, I learned. Because of that painful situation, I grew. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like that, like a conflict of guilt, where you're like, I don't want to feel good that my husband passed away. Like I don't want to, you know what I mean? Like do you yeah, have that conflict yeah. emotions? I don't. No. Um, or usually, not that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Like because I like I. That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess like if you just tie it to like the Qadr of Allah. Kind of thing, yeah, like I don't uh, ever feel good that mm -hmm. my husband passed. Like to say something like, um, like I'm glad this happened. Like mm -hmm. I would never say I'm glad this happened mm -hmm. because it was something that was very difficult and it's, it's still difficult till now. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Like when you tie it to the Qadr of Allah, you think, well, you know what, even though it was hard, benefits came out of it and mm -hmm. i think that's a good way to frame it like something beneficial came out of this difficult situation and i think that you can kind of extrapolate to a lot of situations that happen to us like yeah. we all go through things that are 
like really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we look back on it a year later or 10 years later, we're like, actually, you know, if that thing hadn't happened to me, then I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. Kind of thing. So you see the benefit in it without saying, oh, I'm glad that happened. Right. Because that mm. would be kind of a tough thing to do. Yeah. But um, like, I don't really see a conflict there. Like I can be upset and sad and angry about what happened to my husband. And at the mm. same time, parallel, see the beneficial things that have come out of it. Yeah. Right. I don't I don't know. Yeah. No, that's powerful. Cause I think one of the traps people fall into and in whenever there's a painful situation is that they can't mm. make that separation. Yeah, but then also you're asking me five years later. That's true. Right, so if you were to ask me like a few months after, maybe my answer would have been completely different. Right. Right. Yeah, Uh, that's that's really interesting. I mean, I was just thinking the other day, I was watching a video of Malcolm X, and uh, when I was a kid, I grew up idolizing him to a certain Mm -hmm. extent. And even like today, sometimes I think, I'm like, wow, if he didn't get killed, he could have been like this amazing leader for the Muslim community. He could have been like... Etc. 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 And then I was watching this one video, and they were talking to prison inmates. So yeah. There's a video going around right now, and um, the prison in- inmates were like, "Yeah, we accepted Islam because of Malcolm X." And it's like 50 years later. 50 yeah, years later, I think Subhanallah. Even though you might think, "Oh, it would have been better for him to live," and to, maybe his legacy was best where Allah decided for him to pass away, right? Yeah. So we we think we know it's best, but really we don't. And, uh, yeah. No. 100. percent Like I think. Um, I've had a lot of time to think about that and like because we know that like even before we're born we have a certain amount of risk that's set for us yeah. right so even for me to just think of you know what this was my husband's risk and it ended that day and it was never going to go past that day mm-hmm. that was like a hard that was a part of the grief I was like mm-hmm. oh this was the limit like and I was never meant to live with him past a certain period of time so that in and of itself was kind of hard because then you, your mind goes to dark places, right? Mm-hmm. Your mind is like, well, why did this have to happen to me? Or like um, <sighs> struggling to figure out how to express this. But like, um, so y- your risk is set for a certain period of time, yeah. right? And then um, like we all grieve when somebody passes away without thinking about the fact that their life was never meant to go beyond that day, beyond that minute right like beyond that minute there is no risk for that person anymore yeah so i don't know it's kind of an interesting thing to think about um yeah and and it's hard it's hard to come to terms with right Mm -hmm. because because as human beings we plan and we kind of see ourselves living not forever but we're like okay we're gonna live to at least like 90 yeah and then when that's cut short it's just like it feels feel like it feels premature Mm -hmm. right but the reality is that none of us are guaranteed old age, yeah. right? I so. think sometimes we live our lives like thinking we're entitled to certain things. Yeah. <clears throat> and then once that, like you realize that you're not entitled to it, it's just yeah. like... Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a big a, thing too. Tough, yeah, like, yeah. Um, like feeling that I was entitled to a long, happy life with, with my husband, with kids, with all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then like having him pass away... Um, like to come to a realization that I am not entitled to what I think I'm entitled to. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, I'm entitled, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us certain things, promises us certain things that we are entitled to if we do certain actions or whatever. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, we're not entitled to any of the blessings that he gives us, yeah. right? Those are just temporary gifts, which is why I call my book a temporary gift. <laughs> but those are just, um, they're, they're essentially, there are things that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, ha, has blessed us with and he can give them or take them however he pleases because those are things that belong to him, not mm-hmm. to us. Yeah. Right. It's interesting because, you know, I, I was doing this training a few months ago about atheism and all of that. And mm-hmm. uh, so like the major, when you look at the statistics, the major reason people um, stop believing in God is always because of the problem of evil mm-hmm. and, and pain and difficulty to enter their lives and I feel like it just like it opens this door of like how are you going to respond how is your emotions going to respond to it are you when you realize that you're not entitled to something in this world are you just going to get angry and um like rebel against God or like where is your emotions going to take because that's like that's the whole question that's the whole test of this life right um so I find like this is a really interesting area of discussion because it kind of it frames that whole yeah, and I mean, 
It's interesting because like you see a, like different kinds of people like mentioned in the Quran, for example, mm -hmm. where you have somebody who or people who will only turn to Allah when they're in like mm -hmm. they're on the ship, they're on a ship in the storm, like yeah. they're they're in a really dark place or about to die, kind of they're about to perish, and then they call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty makes them call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when they're finally safe again, they go back to worshipping nobody or worshipping idols or whatnot. Yeah. And then there are people who only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they're blessed with something good mm -hmm. and, that, and then right when that's taken away they're like oh then there can't be a god yeah. because how could a god possibly do this to me or to that person or whatever yeah. so it's almost like people are are in one of the two camps like mm -hmm. almost innately in a mm -hmm. sense whereas believers we should be able to take either situation and frame that frame that properly right mm -hmm. like um if a believer is, if something bad happens to a believer and he's patient, then it's good for him. If something mm. good happens to a believer, then he's grateful for it, and then and that's good for him. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's that's a hard place to come to. Mm. It's a really hard place to come to. You have to struggle with yourself. Yeah. But then, like, I think it's important too to kind of look at your life and figure out which camp you fall into. Yeah. Like, are you the kind of person who turns, who gets angry and turns away from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala when? something hard happens to you or um, kind of like that's or do you only turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when something hard happens to you yeah that makes sense yeah yeah so like I think that all of us are kind of naturally in like have a tendency towards one or the other mm -hmm. and when you figure out where you are then you can kind of be like you know what I need to work on this other aspect of myself yeah. so yeah it's true I mean I, I think naturally I kind of fall into that when things are tough then I start and like do more ibadah and other mm -hmm. than that like I kind of become more negligent so yeah it's like an, it's an internal battle but it's it's important like the first starting point is to be aware of who you are and, and, yeah. and how you react and what your natural inclinations are 100% mm, yeah so y you go through this difficult time and then you kind of from there you start writing online and you kind of create this um, this platform through your social media um, where you took this difficulty and you kind of made it really positive. Um, how, did, how did that start off? How did that, how did that come together? So just like my kids' books, um, everything kind of seems like it happened by accident. Because mm -hmm. like I never really th sat there and thought, I want to create a platform or I want to do X, Y, Z, or I want to write a book or I, I want to do anything. That's mm -hmm. never kind of, it's never something that occurred to me. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think the first thing I wrote was literally like the day after my husband passed away. I think probably the day of his janeza. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wrote that, it was like a long note. Um, the reason I wrote that is because I was getting like hundreds and hundreds of messages mm -hmm. of people wanting to know if I was okay and, and all this stuff. And I couldn't respond mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. Like even my close friend, like I couldn't respond to them, even my family members. So I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write this out. I'm going to post it so that everybody will leave, <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> not leave me alone, but like, um, so everyone will kind of know. Yeah, so yeah. I don't have to answer people individually. Yeah. Everybody will kind of know that I'm like, I'm alive. I'm okay. I'm yeah. whatever. Um, so I wrote that. And then a lot of people shared it. And I was kind of surprised at that, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, after that, like all the posts that I wrote on Facebook and, and other social media, like I... Like I almost wrote it out of necessity, mm -hmm. like to my emotional state. Cause like I've always been the kind of person who, when I'm going through something, I have to write it down mm -hmm. or like I have to write something about it. So that's just always the kind of person that I was, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when this happened, it wasn't any different, right? Like I had to use my writing to, to kind of process my emotions, right? right? Because that, like I said before, it takes you to a very dark place. And if you don't have anything to take you out of that or to kind of um, release the pressure in a sense like you're gonna burst right so for me writing was that thing um, yeah so then I started posting and people started enjoying what I wrote and then I kept writing just out of necessity because um, I feel like for a lot of writers um, not that I knew that I was a writer but a lot of writers, sometimes they have this like this <coughs> nagging thing within them mm -hmm. and it doesn't go away right. until it's written down. 
Like it'll never mm. go away. So though all those nagging things, like they had to, they had to be expressed, right? And then on top of that, like I was also driven by um, not wanting people to forget about what happened to my husband and like the injustice mm. around it. And I'm not like a very politically savvy person. Like I mm. basically know very little about politics, especially in Egypt, because I was born and raised in Canada. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, that that was definitely one of my motivators and kind of to create a legacy of Sadh Khajariya for him. Mm-hmm. And like, alhamdulillah, people have really connected to our story. I think one of the reasons is that like I was very open about mm. Everything, because right. at that point in my life, I just stopped caring right. about. Not Scott stopped caring, but it stopped caring about what people thought mm. I should say or shouldn't say. Not to say that I didn't self-filter. Of course, I did. Right? There were certain things that I wouldn't say publicly, or or right. that I wouldn't express publicly. But um, it's kind of like, what's the worst that can happen right now? Exactly, because literally the worst thing that could happen already happened. Mm-hmm. So who cares if I get haters sending me messages saying, hey, why are you writing about this? Get over it. Because mm-hmm. I get messages like that, like, you know what, you should stop writing about your husband. You should get over it, you should move on. Wow. <laughs> it used to bother me, but now kind of just doesn't anymore because I'm like, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, or people saying, it's it's haram to post pictures of people who are who have died. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, I, it's just like, I don't know. I think yeah. when you put yourself on social media, like you kind of have to, stuff, yeah. you kind of have to expect that there are going to be people who mm. say stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it used to bother me. It doesn't bother me that much anymore. Kind of just like I've developed a very thick skin when it comes to that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so Did yeah. you consider yourself a writer before you started writing on social media? I used to write, but I'd never considered myself a writer. And even, oh, uh, yeah. even up on like, even now, like I'll say that I'm a writer. I won't say that I'm a writer. I'll say that I write mm. because I do a lot of other things besides writing, I right. guess. Um, and I feel like when you say you're a writer, it kind of inflates your ego in a sense. Mm-hmm. So it's hard for me to or it, it kind of it. It makes you feel like you're more talented than you are. <laughs> and I just didn't want that. I guess also it's kind of like if you say you're a writer, it means that like you're going to write. You're going to continuously produce stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, that's like, true. you're writing for a purpose, I guess. That's yeah, like, that's also true. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm ever going to publish another book. Like, we'll right. see, right? But mm-hmm. if I say I'm a writer and that's my identity, then you how could to. I not publish another book? Yeah. And then I'll just publish any nonsense, exactly, right? Just yeah. in order to fulfill that title of being a writer. Sure. So, I think um, it's interesting, that, like you said, you're writing for yourself. Um, so when I first started write, writing khutbahs and giving khutbahs, um, I don't do it much anymore. But when mm-hmm. I started, it was kind of the same thing where I was like, Ibrahim, you idiot. And then I like write myself in a <laughs> And then I just <laughs> you know, wipe out my name from it. Yeah, um, no, that's interesting. Um, that was basically my motivation was I was basically talking to myself. And, and um, those are probably like my, yeah. best, my best writings. And then mm-hmm. now when you feel the pressure every single week, you have to say something. And sometimes you don't have much to say. That's when I find it difficult. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Like I think a lot of the the best writing that I've done is stuff that's about myself, or like stuff that, like I would kind of like I'd be feeling something, I'd put it on a page, and then I'd be like, well, how can I? And then looking looking at the words on a page, mm-hmm. how can I rearrange this to be positive, to be a reminder, not to remind other people, but to remind myself. Mm-hmm. So um, so I would do that and then post it. And uh, I think a lot of people felt like I was on a really high spiritual plane or something that like, <laughs> oh my God, she's amazing. She's so this and that. But like, you're right. It's, it's as if I was yeah. just writing a reminder to myself to kind of read when um, I was feeling low or whatever. Right. So, yeah. Interesting. So it's kind of like you're in a dark place and then you're trying mm. to force yourself out of it by yeah. writing something hopeful. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah, not like, to say like that I didn't believe what I was writing, I did. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes it came across really positively. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did that consciously too. Right. Because like I, like I was conscious of the fact that when something is expressed on social media, like whether you like it or not, people are gonna be affected by it. 
Mm-hmm. So are you going to post something that's going to affect people positively or are you going to post something that's going to affect people negatively and make them kind of feel like less hopeful or, or, or whatever, right. right? So even if I was feeling that, like on a bad day or something, feeling like the less hopeful aspect of it or struggling or whatever, I wouldn't necessarily write about that in a negative way because, yeah, because of that consciousness that even if I'm feeling this myself, it doesn't mean I have to spread it to other people. Mm-hmm. So that was important to me too. That's really powerful, actually. I think that's, like, one of the major issues on social media is that um, it's just that idea that, like, what you're putting out there, it doesn't just involve you. you, It involves everyone who sees what you write. Yeah. And people, I think, underestimate how many people see what they put out there. Um, Yeah, but but even if they even if just one person sees what they put out there and it affects them negatively, like that's that's on your conscious Mm -hmm. conscience. Um, and I mean that's yeah that's on your conscience like yeah. we're accountable for everything that we say and write and do mm-hmm. and if we like if I do something wrong and then my daughter sees me and she imitates me and she imitates me for the rest of her life mm-hmm. every time she does that thing like I'm going to be held accountable for that because yeah. I'm the one that showed her how to do that thing yeah. right yeah. which is a super scary thing to think about yeah, but like and also vice versa right you teach your kids or you teach other people good positive things positive beliefs and every time they enact those things or they do those actions and um that's like a sadhga for you right it's a mm-hmm. continuous charity so that was that was a good motivator and that's like i try to make that still a good motivator for me mm-hmm. whenever i write or do anything and like so now like five years later do you find it difficult mm-hmm. sometimes to write or <clears throat> or is it easier to write or well write about what to, to just produce? Um, I think it's harder to produce just because I'm more busy with other things. Mm-hmm. Like I, there's a lot of things that take up my time now that didn't used to take up my time then. Mm-hmm. Um, like I have like a very small publishing company, like mm-hmm. bold, the word very small <laughs> publishing company. But even that like tiny little thing that takes up a lot of time. So mm-hmm. when your mental energy is going towards something it's obviously going to be taken away from something else. Right. Um, but I don't feel pressure to write. Like when I want to write something, I will. And when I don't want to write something, I'm not going to put something out there just for the sake of putting something out there. Because mm. why? Yeah. Because why? And yeah. that's a terrible sentence, but because why? Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. But, but, it, but it is harder. Like, sorry to interrupt you. No. It is harder um, to connect if I wanted to write about that that emotional space that I was in mm. all those years ago, it's harder to write something about that because I'm so distanced, from, not so distanced, but I'm more distanced from it now than mm. I was even two years ago. Right. So, um, like I still write about, sometimes about uh, the emotions around that or difficulties or struggles. Um, mm. Sometimes I write about that, sometimes I write about other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but I guess one of the issues is that with social media, you only grow on it if you're consistently writing or consistently putting out content. And yeah. if not, just like, you know, the, the algorithms just yep. like push you behind. <laughs> um, so then people feel like that, yeah. that need to always put something out. So then. Yeah. So yeah. that darn social media <laughs> algorithm, like that's a thing. That's definitely a thing. Because yeah. um, like I use Instagram and Facebook. I can't really bear to use anything else. It's Instagram and Facebook is already too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. Like even if even if on Instagram I go t- three days without posting, yeah. and then I post something, it'll get like one tenth of the traction that wow. um, that my previous <coughs> posts have gotten. Wow. And th- you're right. It's it's a lot of pressure. Um, but and I struggle with that too. Like I struggle with my presence on social media. It's not something mm-hmm. that comes easy to me. Um, and then the other thing that doesn't come easy to me is like constantly putting myself out there or like making claims about my books mm-hmm. to sell them. Like right. that marketing thing is just so foreign to me. Like this yeah. book is going to change your life. I can't say that this yeah. book is going to change your life. Like I, I know that some people can say that or when they maybe they're marketing other people's books but i'm marketing my own book right yeah it feels weird yeah like i i've always been a very like content heavy Mm. type of quote-unquote advertiser right um because i like i genuinely believe if something has good content and i put that content out there then people are going to be interested and i don't like i don't like the fanfare Mm. and i don't like that 
Yeah. That kind of stuff. Um, but it's hard because if you write, this book may or may not change your life. I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't write this book may or may not. I wouldn't even say that. But I would maybe talk about my own experience writing the book or maybe post somebody's um, reflections on the book right. or like a review mm. or something. But even that, like, it's so cringeworthy to me, even now, like mm -hmm. even like years later, it's just, it's hard. It's really hard to self-promote. I don't know if that's yeah. like a product of, uh, if that comes from being a, a female and that perhaps it would be easier for a male to promote. Cause like there's mm -hmm. all these like differences between males and females and how yeah. um, males feel more comfortable like making those kinds of claims. Not that they're false claims, just like yeah. uh, they have like maybe a level of comfort that maybe women don't have. Mm -hmm. Or that's a really general statement. Wow. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I struggle with it, <clears throat> to be honest. Yeah. But I kind of see what you mean. Like, I think probably on like the aggregate, there's probably more men who feel like that super confidence in their work that they can make those claims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, what does Selma <clears throat> say? Your sister? She says, uh, "I want to have <laughs> the confidence of." Uh, an average white male? Is that what she yeah, says? She says like that, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's that always makes me laugh. But um, yeah, and I, I think you know, I think it's partially just my nature too. Like I've, like social media is a very like Facebook. I find a little bit easier because it's mm -hmm. not um, image heavy. It's like right. it's always <clears throat> text. Like I and I, it's easier for me to do that. Whereas Instagram is like images and yeah. like for people to engage with images, it has to be pictures of yourself. Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't want to post a picture of myself today. Like, I just yeah. want to post like, text. I just want to post content. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to have the pressure of having to post something that looks beautiful or whatever. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's really a lot. And yeah. then kind of figuring out a balance of how do I connect with people genuinely in a way that's genuine, not only to them, but to myself and still maintain enough interest that people are actually going to come read what i'm saying yeah right so that's like that balance is it's hard to strike that balance mm -hmm. oh, definitely um did you <clears throat> did you catch that story about the girl who shot up uh youtube yes unfortunately i yeah. did so I, I actually i was mentioning it to my wife yesterday and she had no mm -hmm. idea i don't know how people missed it <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're off Facebook for like two or three days, like you miss a lot yeah, of stuff. True. But yeah, I saw that. Um, I saw that piece is really yeah. disturbing. Did you see her videos? Um, I saw like I didn't watch any of her full videos, but I saw like news sort of news videos yeah. right. where they kind of just showed some images and some like short clips of her videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were super weird, to be honest yeah. with you. They were like crazy weird. random. Yeah, I don't know. But um, but there was yep. this one video and she was just going off <clears throat> on Facebook because I guess Facebook put like an age restriction on her videos. Oh. Sorry, okay. YouTube, YouTube, okay. Facebook, uh, age restriction on her videos. And she was basically saying like the algorithms were causing her not to get any more views. And she was so angry. Like you could just see the anger in her. Yeah. Uh, and apparently like so that she went missing the day before and the, her dad called the police and was like, something's wrong with her and mm -hmm. she's gonna do something probably to youtube like because she was just ranting about it all the time at one point she stood outside with like a like protesting with like a poster yeah against youtube so he told the police and the police were like well we have nothing to hold her for they let her go and then the next day she went and she shot it up but so they actually arrested her and then let her go yeah well, i didn't realize that yeah um well like oh. they didn't they didn't charge her or anything they just she was missing they found mm -hmm. her they took her, they're like, we, we can't hold her for anything, so. Um, but it was crazy, because just watching that, to see somebody so, you know, their identity so connected to their social media existence, it's yeah. just, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, that's, I think that's what a lot of people are starting to fall into, and hopefully, like, that, yeah. that's not going to repeat itself, right? Um, yeah. But, but you're right, like, when your identity becomes so intertwined with your presence on social media, which um, is kind of a fake reality, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. Um, and then that goes away or you can no longer make the same impact, then part of your identity, you feel like part of your identity has died. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of, it's almost like um, a feeling of grief for yourself, like that part of you has died. Mm -hmm. 
And that's like a really intense thing to feel, I, like I presume, mm-hmm. right? Um, so yeah, I think that, like I honestly think that's a lesson to all of us that we need to actually go out and have actual lives in, in reality. Yeah. Because like, to be, to be honest with you, that's what I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to have contact with people mm-hmm. and to actually live in reality. And that's not, that's not to say that we shouldn't use social media, but social media should be a tool that's used for a certain purpose, mm-hmm. not whatever this woman was doing. Like, right. that it's such an integral part of her identity that when it goes away, she kind of just goes ballistic, right? Yeah. Um, it's crazy like, because, like, frankly, your social media existence could come and go in a second. Like yeah, like and I mean, that's happened to a lot of people <coughs> I know, actually, that even when it comes to businesses where mm-hmm. um, they'll have like a page and they'll have like 50,000 followers or something or like mm-hmm. 100,000 followers. And then Facebook decides to close it for yeah. some reason, like they violated some something in like the fine print that they didn't read or yeah. whatever. So they close it and then they have to start from scratch from that's zero followers. Yeah. And like this happened to people I know and who it might happen to me someday. Um, yeah. And it's devastating, right? Because like that's something that you work towards for years. Yeah. But again, like you have to have the perspective of like I feel like everything comes back to having this certainty that whatever happens in your life was meant to happen a certain way for a certain purpose. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you don't know the purpose right now, but or maybe you'll never know the purpose, right? Yeah. But um you have to make a conscious decision to use whatever happens to you. Mm-hmm. Um to become a better worshiper, to become a b- better believer, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, social media, like, it's such a black hole. It's, it's so easy to just scroll for an entire hour and then look at the time and be like, how did I spend an hour scrolling through nonsense? Yeah. Um, and like, I've, like, in the past while, like, I've actually made a point in my life to schedule things into my life where I actually see people. Mm-hmm. And I, that sounds so silly, but like, when it, like, you you think, okay, well, I see people, but in reality, you're going to drop your kids off at school, you're going yeah. back home, because well, for me, I work from home, mm-hmm. right? So, like, I don't see, I don't have, like, full, like, adult conversations with people, yeah. um, unless I specifically schedule it in. Right. So, um, like, <laughs> I force myself to join a book club, to, like, do a week, weekly halaqa, like, there are certain things that I have forced myself to do because... I want to be anchored in actual reality mm-hmm. and not in a social media world. Yeah. So no, I think especially like, I mean, for me personally, like I'm introverted naturally. Mm-hmm. And then like social media kind of like gives you this, this feeling like you're connected to people without actually being connected to people. Absolutely. The feeling of like you have a relationship with people. Absolutely. You're in contact with them, but you're not actually. Yeah. So it's like it fools you really, really yeah. strongly. And, uh, and then on top of that, like you have, you might have contact with a lot of people mm-hmm. on Facebook. So that makes you feel even more connected. But you have a relationship with that, yeah. when, when you, like you need, like human beings need close relationships, mm-hmm. right? And I remember reading some study about how um, the predictor for long lives, they've always said, okay, the predictor is like um, activity and health and all of this stuff. But what they realize is that the number one predictor um for like a prolonged life i don't know if i'm saying this right but anyway um is your close relationships and i was like i was shocked to read that um and i thought like so many of us are going to struggle with that i think when we get older because because of the world we live in right now where we're not closely connected to people we're just connected to people on a surface level um so yeah, I think that that's something that we all have to be proactive about. Yeah. Like actually anchoring ourselves in reality for the benefit, for, I mean, for our own benefit, selfish benefit, of course, but like, even as believers, like we go and we pray in congregation yeah. and like we're around people all the time. And like, that's how it's meant to be. You connect with people in that way. Yeah. Right. And that strength, strengthens your faith as well. For sure. It's interesting because, I mean, first of all, there's a hadith of the prophet um, whoever wants to increase their wealth and uh, lengthen their life mm. and let them um, fulfill their ties of kinship. Mm. And I remember once I was in Mecca and I was listening to a halaqa from one of the shiuch in, in the haram and he said, if you, call, someone asked him, if, if I call my relatives on the phone, is that considered 
like um, keeping my ties of kinship? And he said, no. Wow. Yeah. Now, this is like kind of before social media. Right. Um, but still, like, I was like, whoa. Was, cause, and I was so like, maintaining is, your ties of kinship is like a face-to-face kind of thing. That's what he was saying. Now, obviously, for, for us, like, I was like, listen, man, like, I live in Canada. I have my, how am I going to keep up my relationships with my cousins in Egypt if, if I've seen yeah, them in person? Yeah. But, like, to see that level of, from his perspective, like, you have to see them in person. Um, mm. And then now you put that against, like, the social media world. And you're like, then I guess none of us are really upholding that. Um, like, you get kids sitting in one room yeah. texting their parents in the yeah. other room because they don't want to look at them yeah. face to face. And it's crazy. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Like, I think when you get older, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be so impactful to people's health because at some point you're going to be like, I don't actually have a relationship with people. I know people, yeah. but I don't have a relationship with them because yeah. I don't spend time to the face. Like, if I get sick, case. who's going to drive me to the hospital yeah. kind of thing? Yeah. Um, and you're not going to call up somebody that you kind of know yeah. and be like, hey, can you drive me to my doctor's appointment or whatever? Yeah. It's just you're not going to do it. So you're, you're right. Yeah. Um, but like ties of kinship is something that I really struggle with. Um, mm. Like all, I only have immediate family in Canada. Like mm-hmm. I don't have any uncles or aunts or cousins or anything in Canada. Yeah. Um, they're kind of like just spread out over the whole world. Um, but like I think in a sense we need to be a little bit more realistic that like mm. if we do call them regularly or even message them regularly mm-hmm. um not that that's good enough but like that's still something yeah um and even that i haven't been doing well like but for me like my struggle is like sorry to go off topic but um like i have relatives that are um like politically on the other side uh, um, the worst. like even after everything <sighs> that happened eh? see okay i was just telling my sister yesterday about uh, one of my relatives, not to mention any relations or names or anything, just in case. But um, so after my husband passed away, my mother-in-law, I was staying with my mother-in-law in in Egypt and um, like she had set up chairs in the living room, almost like instinctually. She kind of just like pushed all the furniture to the walls, set up chairs in the living room so that people, because she knew people were going to come and drop in and visit. That's just the culture. And they did, like a lot of people came. And some of the people that came, and this was literally like two days after or three days after, and like everybody is still so devastated and raw and just like still kind of in that state of shock and disbelief. I had people come to um, the place, to to her her house, and like actually argue in front of us about politics and like how... Like one woman, one woman would say, okay, um, no, you know, the people in Rabah and Rabah was like two days before mm-hmm. um, the massacre in Alexandria. Yeah. Um, they were such good people and like it's such a, like a tragic thing that happened. Just like a very basic kind of, mm-hmm. like almost like a yeah. part of our conversation that you would have with like a grief stricken person that, you know, this yeah. is happening to a lot of people and like, and then some, somebody who's related to me. Um, started arguing with her about how no they weren't good people and this and that and I'm like do you see me sitting right here and do you realize that you're talking about my husband yeah and this is somebody like it's hard because like those people are supposed to be in your corner when something like this happens and they're just not and like at the very least you'd expect them to be silent Mm -hmm. but like Egyptians like I don't know what to say Egyptians (laughs) have like a really hard time figuring out like when to just not talk um so yeah, until this day, like a lot of people have not changed. Some people have changed their um, political views, like after mm-hmm. my husband passed away. Yeah. And some people have not. And I find it really difficult, I'll be honest with you, like to keep in touch with those people that have not. Yeah. Like there are people that I haven't talked to for almost five years. Wow. And like, it's not to say that if I didn't see them, I wouldn't say salam and I wouldn't kind of ask about them and their it's families not, and stuff. But like, kind of thing. yeah, but also I think that <clears throat> because we're distance by all this like um this space right like uh we don't keep in touch anyway yeah. or like we even before like we would have conversations here and there but not really significant we don't have a right. significant relationship but now i'm just like and like after like in the few months after my husband passed away any relative that would say anything like against or anything pro cc or anything like remotely 
disrespectful to me would immediately be de- blocked and deleted. Yeah. Like because I'm just like I don't have space in my heart for this right now. Yeah. And then it kind of just became a habit. And I don't blame you. I mean, I, I mean, in a sense, I don't blame myself either, but like I struggle with that idea of like maintaining ties of kinship because I know it's important. So this is one of my struggles. Like, I don't know. I don't have a solution as of yet. Yeah. But yeah. No, that's crazy. I think I feel like everybody has family members who are like yes. super supportive. Every 100%. single person. 100 percent. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was weird. So I have this like distant cousin, I guess twice removed I don't even I have no idea how he's related to me <clears throat> he added everyone with the same last name on, on uh, oh. Facebook <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm not even sure how he's related but he's related mm. somehow okay um, and he was like full on board with CC posting mm. all this stuff like 100% and I got into an argument with him on Facebook at some point Damn. and uh, I don't know was it last year or something um, I had a meeting with um Christia Freeland, who's the foreign minister of Canada. Okay. Um, and I posted, someone took a picture, I posted the picture on my Facebook. As soon as he saw that picture, he messaged me privately. And he's like, um, I guess he thinks like I have like connections or something like that. Oh, <laughs> like wow. Okay. In Egyptian uh, standards. And he's like, can you get me citizenship to Canada? I'm like, why? Yeah. Didn't you love CC? Like, just uh, <laughs> stick it out with him. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Totally close that yeah. door on him. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really non-empathetic, like, astaghfirullah, yeah. but like, I'm so non-empathetic to Egyptians. Like, I, like, whenever I see something terrible happening in Egypt, <clears throat> I mean, like, obviously there are good people. There are yeah. many good people in Egypt and they're going through something really difficult and I do, I have empathy with them. Mm-hmm. But like, the people who are pro CC and who are still pro CC, when bad things happen, I'm just like, well, I mean, you yeah. kind of brought it upon yourself. Yeah. Right. Even if in your heart, you didn't think what happened was wrong. Yeah. Even in your heart, like, it's kind of like, well, what did you expect to happen? Yeah. So, I don't know. Let's just say I have a lot of demons that I myself am working through because, like, I know that there are certain things that I shouldn't. Yeah. Um, not that I shouldn't be feeling, but certain things that I have to work on. It's like the byproduct of the anger that you feel. Yeah, exactly. But but at the same time, like I want to also be merciful to myself that like, yeah. like, like the I did under yeah, not ju- not always justified, mm-hmm. but like even if it's not justified, like I'm still a human being. Like mm-hmm. I still have weaknesses, and like mm-hmm. if something is going to cause me a lot of pain to do, then maybe it's okay to like if it's not something obligatory on me. I mean, yeah. maybe it's okay to not do it for now. Yeah, kind of thing. And like that's a that's a funny thing when uh, when I talk about anger when you mention anger, um, I also sometimes have people message me saying like sister you know you should just forgive them, mm. and I'm just like, no, like, no. And like the th- yeah. the thing is I like at this point almost five years later, like um, what happened doesn't occupy my thoughts every day or doesn't like yeah. determine what I do or have like a huge effect on me, mm-hmm. but even then like. I, if I don't have an obligation to forgive somebody and I don't want to forgive them, then I'm not going to forgive them. Like, and that might sound petty, but like, <clears throat> like, I don't know. And I often think about like, I, like, I'm sure you've seen those videos where like, um, there were two videos recently where, um, like a mother came face to face with the person who killed her son and she forgave right. him. And then there was, before that, there was a father who came face to face with, um, the person who killed his son as well Mm -hmm. and they were just like so open and forgiving and i look at those things i'm like that's beautiful but like i will never do that and i I think there's a difference though like in that that case she's like a 16 year old kid you know he doesn't know better you know he's like really bad circumstances versus you know um basically a a, a system in egypt that till this day continues to kidnap people continues to kill people continues to torture people like it's not not exactly equal right and Um, and the other thing too is that these are people who are in a courtroom and who are being um tried for their crimes kind of thing whereas like i don't know who killed my husband like i don't have a name i don't have a face i don't have i don't know if this person was old or young i don't know and like till this day all the people who were killed in Rabah and before and after in other places like 
these are all done by quote unquote nameless and faceless people mm -hmm. because not a single person has been uh, brought to justice yeah. for it right or expressed any kind of remorse for it or anything like that so that's also i mean that's also like another layer to it oh. um but yeah like it's yeah it's easy for people to say just forgive them yeah. when they haven't actually experienced it themselves right. and yeah again when you're on social media <laughs> a lot <laughs> of things come your way yeah. that make you really think for sure yeah. one the like you're just talking about social media being like imaginary I don't know, but like from my perspective, because I always have guys who are like, <clears throat> try to find me a wife, try to find me a wife, try to find me a wife. And then they're so like, they're that Instagram generation, right? Yes. And uh, so then you bring them like a bunch of people and all of them, they're like, nope, 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 for like really stupid reasons. And then you figure out eventually, and this happened multiple times for me now, that like they want the Instagram person and you're like, that's not a real human being. <laughs> that's just like five hours of makeup and whatever. That's yeah, not, that's yeah, not a yeah. true human being. And but people are yeah. so warped now, like these, especially young guys. Yeah, I would say probably twenty five and younger or so. Yeah, like, something like that. That's really hard to think about. Yeah. Um, and you're right. That's it's not it's not reality. Yeah. And like you can you can find the person who's like who has like the best Instagram page and like the most beautiful instagram page and then when you actually get married and live with that person they're like oh you're like oh you're actually a normal human being yeah. let's get divorced because i didn't expect this yeah. or what I, like it's just um my expectations were somewhere completely yeah yeah, yeah. and i think that's why i think that like we have to pull back or we have to kind of um like you know uh you're supposed to hold money in your hand and not in your heart, mm -hmm. right? Like money, for example, is supposed to be a tool and not yeah. something that dictates who you are as a person. Yeah. The same thing goes with social media. That like, if it's beneficial for us, we should be involved in it. If it's not beneficial for us, we should not be involved in it. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to tell young people, even me, yeah. although I'm not 25, but like, it's hard to tell our generation of people or the younger generation to not be involved in social media because everything happens on social media now, yeah. right? Yeah. Like but i think it's just yeah it's a struggle for yeah. for this generation like i i don't envy them for that yeah so yeah i think it's like even if you just gave yourself time to disengage although like it's difficult because i'm like i'm expected to build and you, uh, you're obviously expected to build social media presence yeah even though i still do it like i still will sometimes go a week without posting anything or a week and a half without posting anything yeah. but even though i know it's really bad for my algorithms and all no that. you know you know what but i've i found helpful is to post something and then to delete the app from my phone mm -hmm. um i do that sometimes Sorry. like i'll post something and i'll just delete the app and then kind of just let it do its own thing yeah. and then go back to it like the next day or something not just so that i'm not constantly checking, checking i do this sometimes and, stuff, and other yeah. times i don't and it's bad yeah but like um like, I feel like you can still kind of maintain this activity to, like, to the point, to the level where you're getting the engagement, mm -hmm. but still detach yourself from it. It's a very difficult thing to do, yeah. but it's still possible to do it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I've been giving a talk on social media to kids now for probably like a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've done a number of different mosques. And the first thing I would start off with is that the problem with social media is that it builds this playing field where you only get your validation from other human beings. Yeah. And oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. like when I saw that girl walk up and shoot those people in, in mm -hmm. YouTube, I'm like her entire validation came from other people. Yeah. And from her perspective, YouTube took that away and now she has no validation. And that's crazy. So yeah. Yeah. That's that's an interesting thing to think about. Right. Because we like as believers were taught that the only quote unquote validation that we need is like acceptance and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. right? So I feel like social media is kind of playing into this idea that um, like of, um, what's the word, like, like, riya, like you're showing, uh, yeah. like even if you're doing something good, you're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. Right. You're doing it for the sake of something else. Yeah. And we all have to check ourselves on that. Like yeah. none of us are immune to that, no matter how religious quote-unquote or pious you are right. um but yeah like that's one of the reasons that i have vowed to not give my child the phone until she's like mm. i don't know 
until I don't even know. Like <laughs> maybe 15, yeah. 16. Like I, like I, and when I tell that to people, they're like, that's so uh, unreasonable or like, that's not going to happen or whatever. And I'm just like, you know what? Maybe like it could. It could. Like, why does my child need to need to have a phone when she's ten years old? Yeah. Like everywhere that she is, I know where she is, and I know who's with her, and I know how to contact that person or whatever. Mm. Like, I don't want my child growing up being defined by what other people on social media think of her, or being cyberbullied or whatever. Like mm. I, and maybe that's an old-fashioned thing to think, mm. but like I, I didn't get my first cell phone until I was in university. Yeah. But that was normal. That was normal for, for our generation. But mm -hmm. like, I'm very particular about um, like keeping her from social media. And obviously she's only yeah. five. She doesn't even know what social media is. All she knows is like funny filters. Right. But like, I will be militant about this. Yeah. Like I'm not militant about many things, but this is one of the things. Because even in my own life, like I see how it negatively affects me sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, like as much as I say, oh, those messages don't bother me or whatever, but like on a level, they kind of creep in, like they're in your memory, right? Yeah. And they're not, like I still remember them, right? Even though I say that they don't affect me, they're still in my memory. So having them there, I'm sure affects me in some way or another subconsciously. Yeah. So yeah, I want to protect my daughter from that. Oh, it makes sense. Eventually. I mean, I mean, I have the same, same things going through my mind. When, when do you want your kids exposed to that? Um, yeah. Because on the one hand, everything everything's on social media and everything's moving in that direction. You don't want them to like lose that technological advantage. But then on the other hand, there's so much you don't want them exposed to. Yeah, yeah. Know? I mean, to me, again, this is all hypothetical because my child's only five. But mm -hmm. like, to me, the the negatives outweigh the positives. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we'll kind of take it day by day when we get there, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I don't know for ki kids don't have filters right yeah they everything that's said to them gets kind of becomes part of their identity yeah like um, we were at the aquarium in December and we were watching a diving show and the diver was wearing a Santa Claus outfit mm. or Santa suit and, <laughs> and then, like a week or two ago um, I heard a kid in my daughter's class saying, oh, Rukhaya said that Santa is real. And I'm just like, oh, my <laughs> God, like, I can't. And we had talked about it where I'm like, you know, Santa's yeah. not real. This guy was Santa, but, you know, Santa's not real. It's just yeah. like a character or whatever. But like kids. Um, and then I had another talk with hers. But she, so she gets it. But like, yeah. I mean, she could have just been saying that for for whatever. Like kids say weird things all the time. But yeah. like, um yeah, that's something that uh, that we have to be aware of as parents that like everything that our kids see and they're exposed to and hear, yeah. that becomes a part of their identity. It's true. And their beliefs, like it's actually shocking when I just think of that Santa Claus thing. I'm like, it was just a guy in a red suit, and like four months later, it's still in her mind. No, but I saw him in the aquarium. Mm. Yeah, it's it is crazy. We have the same thing. Like even recently, I've been doing a lot of more interfaith work. Okay. So then this guy was like inviting us to um, this Easter thing and egg mm -hmm. hunt and all that. I'm like, I cannot confuse my kids to that level, like yeah. to expose them to that stuff. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. It's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's going yeah, like I, I want to, <laughs> speaking of militant things, maybe militant isn't a good word to use. <laughs> Probably not. But like, um, Let's just say strong values. Mm. That's, a, that's a better way to say it. But like, I'm against lying to my child about anything. Mm. Like I know that, um, but also like I've, I've kind of been put in a situation where like I can't lie. Like for example, like I'll tell her like her father passed away mm -hmm. because that's reality. Like I can't, I can't hide that from her. And I've even had people telling me you shouldn't talk to your daughter about these things. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to say, hey, your dad is in another country and he just doesn't want to talk to you. Like, why would I say such terrible things? Like, mm -hmm. so, but in her mind, like that I, seems I like frame it, more. like I, exactly, like I, I frame it and, and I try to frame it in a positive way. Like, yeah. like he, he's with Allah now, he's in Jannah, inshallah, like I, and then kind of like use that as a motivator to get her to be interested in like, what is this Jannah place, right? Yeah. Um, 
and it's it has become so normal to her now that like to the point where if kids are talking about their dad she'd be like yeah my dad's in jannah mm -hmm. like it's just like a normal yeah. thing to her whereas other people will like be so shocked at that they're like oh my god like that's a heavy topic for a child mm -hmm. but um like i'm I, I have to tell my my kid the truth, not just about that, but about everything. Like, why would yeah. I tell my child that there's a tooth fairy when there isn't? Yeah. Because life has enough fun stuff that that's true, and like, mm. like there's so much amazing things that that kids can experience and do without having to lie to them. Yeah. And like, I don't I don't understand this culture where it's not just a, it's not just like a Western thing, and even in Egypt, like there are imaginary things that yeah. uh, parents tell their kids, and like I just don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. <clears throat> I'm with you on that one. Although, mm. one time we went to a protest for the Rohingya. Okay. Uh, so then Rayanne was asking, my daughter was asking a lot of questions about that. Mm. So we did answer honestly, and I felt like, but for a while, she was having trouble understanding <clears throat> why are there people who want to kill other people just because they're Muslim? And it was like, yeah, it's really like terrible yeah. thing for her to conceive. But right. but at the same time, I feel like if you're if you're telling talking to them about this stuff. Um, like same thing, her grandmother passed away, we tell her that she's mm -hmm. in Jenna, same thing. Um, I feel like you're actually, you're giving them a lot of time to come to terms with it. Because they're yeah. kids, they don't really fully understand it, right. but they keep thinking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and as they get older, they've grown up with this idea now, it's kind of like firmly in their identity it's firmly right. in their in their mind right as opposed to trying to hold it all back and then unleash it on them when they're 12 and then now it's like this huge yeah. like burden they have to like try to wrap That's their heads true. around all of That's a sudden so. just like like if you reveal to a child that santa isn't real they're yeah. like devastated yeah right yeah. like why like why would you create that devastation yeah. when it could have been avoided and now they have to wrap their heads around him not being real yeah and hey my parents lied my to me for the first like me. seven years of my life or whatever uh, but um what else would they lie to me about exactly but then uh -huh. like at the same time um like what you're saying about telling kids the truth mm -hmm. and i'm all for that as well but at the same time like i do have a sense of like um them being told the truth at the right time yeah right like i like i still don't know how I'm going to have a conversation with my daughter about what actually happened to her dad like because mm -hmm. at this point she just knows that he passed away and she right. hasn't asked asked more questions about it right, right. Um, and at some point she's going to find out but like not when she's five mm -hmm. because I feel like that's a really traumatic thing to put on a child yeah. um, so I've never told her like oh he was sick or anything like I've never told a lie yeah. but it's kind of like, bleeding yeah like it we're does, gonna yeah. when i feel she's ready for that conversation then we'll have that conversation mm -hmm. that's not something i'm looking forward to but like yeah. um yeah truth always and always at the right time yeah right yeah sometimes i feel like my wife tells them too much truth <laughs> and I'm i mean like, i'm like you can just avoid the question you don't have to necessarily answer um <laughs> i think it depends like i think Like, I think it depends on, on what it is. Like, yeah. I, I tend to sh uh, not let her, like, I don't like her to watch the news. Right. Like, Al Jazeera or anything. If my dad's watching, I'd be like, okay, come do something else. Mm -hmm. Just because, like, I, like, I notice in my child that she's very sensitive to those things. Like, or even if she sees that, I, like, I have a paper cut or something mm -hmm. and, like, I'm, my finger is bleeding, she'll be very upset. Mm -hmm. Like, it will... And she'll mention it for days. Like, remember when you had a cut? Remember when you had a cut? Mm -hmm. So, like, that's just kind of her nature. So, yeah. um, but other kids' nature is different, right? Sure. So, it's also according to what your kids can handle. Because as a parent, you you have a better sense of what your kids can handle yeah. or not handle. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah definitely. Um, yeah, because I have, Rayanne is, like, super sensitive. Same thing. But then mm. Mariam is, like, super tough. I feel like she could, like, take stuff. And she just, uh, Interesting. She really care, so... Yeah, every personality is different. You have to cater it to them. That's true. I'm out of topics. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything You're else out of topics? Wanna... I'm out of things to say. <laughs> That's a coincidence. <laughs> okay, so. so it's will end it here. Jazak Allah khair for coming and for doing oh, yeah, this. Cool. Inshallah, we can have you <clears throat> on again another day. Um, I mean, but I've run out of things to say, so I don't know. We'll give you like you know, six months to a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> give, give me like enough time to prepare. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.